All right, welcome to church today. I'm really glad that you are in the room or watching online. We are very, very excited to worship with you today. It's a beautiful day outside. It's a beautiful day inside. God is good. Can I get an amen in church today? Let's go. You guys are rowdy. I like that. I love it. Good, good. I want to pray one more time, but before I do that, I want to say a special welcome to anybody who's a guest of ours today. Really glad that you are here in your worship guide on the way in is one of these guys. It's a connect card. Would love to know that you were here in any ways that we can serve you. Fill it out as much as you feel comfortable with and then take it back to Jerome. He's on fire today. It's all about you today, Jerome. Back at Info Central. And we got a gift for you just to say a little thank you for being here and to give you some more information about what's going on here at Redeemer. And uh, God is moving in wonderful ways and we are excited for you to be a part of that. So fill it out. Go see Jerome. We're really glad that you're here. But let's pray one more time. And uh, we're going to dive into the word. God, thank you again for your goodness, for your glory. Think about Moses when he asked for your glory to pass in front of him. And you did not grant that request, but you gave him what he needed. The scripture says your goodness passed before him. And so, Father, today we give you glory and we need your goodness. We just sang words, Holy Spirit, that... You came, that this is not just a theory that we believe in, but we have put our faith, our hope is in the evidence of the things that we cannot see, that our faith is real because you, Jesus, stepped out of the splendors of heaven, out of the unseen and came into what is seen so that we might have life and life to the full. So we love you. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us through the power of your word, your living and active word. And we are here with great expectation that you will speak. So we love you. Thankful for Jesus today. And everybody said, amen. Amen. There is evil in the world. I don't think I have to spend any time convincing you of that if you were just to get in to your Twitter feed or to click on to any number of news sources, you would quickly be convinced of that reality. True? True. Thankfully, though, there is also good in the world. True? True. It's this commingled reality that I don't know about you, but I certainly wrestle with in my soul that I can clearly see the tangible evil and do not understand all that is behind it and why God doesn't act in it. And yet I can clearly taste and see, as the scripture says, that he is good. That commingled reality is real. And even more, it's wrestling with all of us in our own individual ways, not just on a global scale, but on an individual scale. Like every single one of you in the room, watching online, me, all the volunteers back in Redeemer Kids, everybody wrestles with their own commingled reality of good versus evil. And what's really difficult is that oftentimes I'm at the root of that evil. And we were just talking in our our city group with the young adults on Wednesday night, and it was just like, you know, there are times when I treat the people I love the most the worst, right? Like, like what's wrong with me, right? And like, you probably feel that. And so, another example, just a few weeks ago, my, my entire extended family, like 16 of us, were in Zion National Park and just driving through just massive walls of canyons and then literally rappelling into a slot canyon. Come on, give your boy some credit. I'm a a goofy dude to be up there rappelling into, but I do it for the kids, you know? Actually, I I don't. I do it for my wife because she's adventurous and I'm not at all. And I'd rather curl up with coffee and a book at the beach. Can I get an amen in church today, right? (laughs) Half of you were like, no, I love canyons and I would love to do that. (laughs) It's like, you know, Camden would love to go with you. Um, because I'm not that guy, right? But I just was walking up 
what is called the Narrows in Zion National Park and just looking straight up and just watching these walls go and you're hiking through a river. And I was doing it with my 10-year-old and just remember being like, this is amazing. Like this is, you hear us talk about enchanted reality, right? Like this is not enchanted reality, right? Like you, you go step into something that is beyond you, that is bigger than you, that is beautiful, that is from the hand of God and couldn't be explained in any other way. And I was just struck with awe and wonder and you just are in that moment. And yet that very same week, right? So I'm traversing through the beauty and wonder of God. And yet that very same week, like those six days that I was in Zion National Park with my family, an incredible time, experiencing and loving the wonder and beauty and awe and majesty of God, like at that same moment, just in our own country that week, 12 people were shot and killed, 47 others injured by another human being in the United States alone. Like those things were happening simultaneously in the world. And that's not even to go to other countries and places and a lot of places that some of you love and pray for and commingle. There's good and evil in the world. And it's just a stark reality because in light of those truths, like both of those things were true. They were happening. And in light of that, last week I challenged you, how, how are you in this world that we find ourselves, in this secular moment, how will you see God? Right? Like if you take away all the things, all the fluff, all the, what do you need? What do I need? I need to see God. Like in those moments, what matters more than anything else is that I would encounter God. And so last week we talked about that and we drew the conclusion ultimately that we're called to pursue peace with everyone and be holy. And that you're holding up these two realities because what does it look like to pursue peace with everyone? in my city, in this moment, and yet still be holy, right? Because if we were to go to just the top three or four issues that are facing our culture as a Christian, you are going to pursue peace with everyone and you are not going to find it. And so in that moment, pursuing peace, Isaiah said that we seek, or Jeremiah said we seek the welfare of our city, and yet you are a holy people set apart by God for his goodness and purpose in the world, to bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And you will, because they are opposing kingdoms, you will come at odds. And so the the reality is, is Paul wrote, or not Paul, We're going to look at Paul today. But the writer of Hebrews wrote to this small church and said, your faith matters. It matters that you, this little house church, this small group of Christians, that as the light breaks through the cracks into the darkness, that you live out your faith. That it actually matters that you would embody your faith. That the way you live your life does in fact participate in God's holiness. It's a powerful thing to think about. And right on the heels of that, I want to press you further into that and ask the question that the writer of Hebrews asked just before that. He made this statement that there are some things that so easily entangle us. And if we can just be ultra simple, it's... A three-letter word. What is it? Sin. Right? Like, on the cosmic scale, we understand good versus evil, right? It's what makes every good movie good. 
And yet on an individual level, this is the thing that we don't always like to talk about and it doesn't grow big churches and it's not super awesome to be fun, to, but, but it matters because what comes between you and seeing God is often our sin. And we got to talk about it because what gets in the way of you seeing God according to scripture I left a word out of that scripture I quoted you, right? It says, and the sin that so easily entangles you. But here's the reality. I'm not here to condemn you, and Jesus didn't come to this earth to condemn you. In fact, John 3.17 says that he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Good news, right? That's great news, because what I deserve is condemnation. And yet what I get is Jesus. And so it's in that that we ask the question, what gets in the way of me seeing God? What sin gets in the way of me seeing God? And for a follower of Jesus, another way to ask that and to shift gears into what I want to talk to you about today, and it is the title of my sermon, is this. It's a question. How will you fight the devil? How will you fight the devil? But before we go for the jugular, we have some work to do in even wrapping our head around the devil because it's not lost on me that most of the world, even a lot of Christians who profess Jesus don't believe in a literal devil, and I want to say that I emphatically do. But let's start with a story. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1958 published a book called Stride Toward Freedom. And you can imagine all the things that were happening in the 1950s and what he was at the forefront of leading. And we don't have time to unpack all that, but he wrote this memoir of the bus boycotts in Montgomery. And it was really also a how-to on embracing nonviolence and what it looked like to fight with the weapon of love. So here's the turning point according to MLK. Okay, so these are his words now, and I'm quoting from the book. He was at this moment, he says, I was ready to give up, understandable, with my cup of coffee sitting untouched before me. I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing to be a coward. In this state of exhaustion, when my courage had all but gone, I decided to take my problem to God. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and prayed out loud. The words I spoke to God that midnight are still vivid in my memory. So you feel the scenario. He's up in the middle of the night. I believe it was right just soon after somebody had thrown a brick through his front window. And he was wrestling with the idea that I can suffer for you, Lord, but please not my kids. Right? Like things change when we start to bring our kids into the mix. Right? And he's wrestling through that and he's at the end of his rope. And I love that he says, I finally decided to take it to the, to the Lord. And so here's what he prayed. He said, I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right. But now I'm afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership. And if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. That was his prayer. I would venture to say that every single one of you, if you are a follower of Jesus, have had that moment at different times in your life where you're just at the end of what you are capable of doing. There's the human experience in a nutshell. For all the highs that we experience, the valleys will come. And if you're on a mountaintop now, you know the valley will come. And so here's MLK in 1958 writing about this experience. And he says this, he says, At that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never experienced him before. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. 
And he reports this, almost at once my fears began to go. My uncertainty disappeared. I was ready to face anything. And he would go on and face everything. It was in a moment of death that God showed up. It was in a moment of surrender that God came. This is significant for us to get our minds around. Because often the place that we feel like God is most missing is the place where we feel the most pain, the most fear, the most out of control. And yet, isn't it true that it's in those moments where God becomes the most real? Question. In that context, how, do you, how difficult do you think it was for Martin Luther King Jr. to strive for peace with all people? We'll, we'll probably never know, but we can assume that it was excruciatingly difficult. Right? Like if you put yourself in his shoes in that moment, regardless of what you think about all the other things in his life, in that moment, he's attempting to follow the Lord and stand up for what he believes is right and true and good. Excruciatingly difficult. But I love that what he testifies that he heard from God that midnight at his kitchen table was these two things, righteousness and truth. Is there a more applicable thing for you and I to think about in how we choose to live out our faith in this secular moment that we find ourselves? Righteousness and truth. We live in a post-truth culture. And it's important for us to remember that, to see that, and to live in light of that. That Right off the bat, the fact that you believe, that I believe, that there is a God who I cannot see, but yet I know is there and I've given my life to, and I sit in fear and wonder and awe of Him as I stand in a slot canyon in Utah. That it is mystical, it is magical, it is amazing, it is inspiring, and yet it's true. Pretty important. Pretty important for you and I to recognize that immediately before we even get to an offensive issue like marriage, gender, abortion, human rights, all the things that we care about, before we even come to that table, you are already at odds with a culture that says, no, that may be fine for you, but here's what I'm celebrating and I'm going to expect you to celebrate that as well. We're, we're already in difficult territory. So it's super important to recognize that it was at the end of his rope that God showed up. It was in his moment of impingement that God broke through. So back to the question, right? We talk about God being the good shepherd And we read Psalm 23 and we love those parts about being in green pastures and being led by still waters. And yet there's that one sneaky part that says he prepares a table for me where? In the presence of my enemies. He doesn't get rid of my enemies. Right? And doesn't that line up with what he's doing in the world? He says, I did not come to condemn the world. He says, I I would love for all people to be saved. So he's preparing this table for you and I in the presence of our enemies. So what gets in our way of seeing and experiencing God? It is not the people out there. It is not the way our culture votes It is not what political party they find themselves in. It's not those things. Now, you should still vote your conscience. You should still do all of those. You should, as we looked last week, seek the welfare of the city. You should participate in pursuing peace with all people. And a huge factor in that is living as a citizen of the city you find yourself in. And yet, 
you are set apart to be holy. You're set apart for God to bring his kingdom on earth through the church. Your gathering here and every other church that's meeting right now across this city is a visible representation of the kingdom of God breaking into time and space through people. So critically important. So what gets in the way of our seeing and experiencing God? It's not what's happening out there. Because that has always been happening to every generation of Christian that has ever walked the face of this earth. Suffering is part of the gig, right? Jesus said, anyone who desires to live a godly life will suffer persecution. So that's not it. Why do we so often feel like we cannot see God? That is the aim today. Why do you feel like you cannot see God? To know what the writer of Hebrews calls the things, the sin that so easily entangles us. But not just to know it, to fight it, right? A very important part of you living your faith is to actively fight the sin that so easily entangles you. Critically important. So at the risk of sounding too simple, or frankly, like I've lost my marbles in this moment of enlightenment and truth being overcome, at the risk of sounding that simple in this cultural moment, I do believe that the devil is real and he's not Will Will Ferrell's character on SNL. But I believe our fight can be reduced down to knowing what is his tactic and strategy and how can I fight it. Super important. So a little, a, little bit of, a little bit of work here. We know him as Satan, but remember, Satan is a title. It's not a name. Satan is a title. And so uh, the Greek word for devil is diabolos. And so you've probably heard the term diablo. And so it's things that you've heard. It's been a part of the culture that we live in. And it's... Uh, also, Hasatan is the Hebrew word. And so we have these titles. And then on a few occasions, he's referred to as this, the prince of this world. The prince of the power of this world. And then there are at least 25 other titles for the devil in the Bible. So what's happening there? I'm plowing through a lot of Bible to get us to where we want to go. And so stick with me. But what's happening there? How did this guy become, or this angel, or whatever he is, or this demon, or demonic power, how did we get there? How did we go from good creation to evil in the world? The biblical record is that he began life as Lucifer, an angel, an angel of light, a worship leader, Scripture talks about. And then he rebelled against God. And so it's interesting for us to Remember that evil existed before the Garden of Eden, right? I think oftentimes we think that evil entered the world. Well, no, sin came to the human race through Adam and Eve, right? That's what Scripture tells us, but evil existed before that. That rebellion happened in the unseen realm before it happened in the seen realm. And so to this day, the New Testament talks about the fact that our, what we wrestle against in our soul that I talked about at the very start of this is not just the people that we see, but it's the powers of darkness that are in and around you at all times. And so the biblical record talks about how he rebelled against God, desiring glory for himself, and that Jesus tells us himself in the New Testament that he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And then he shows up in the Garden of Eden as a serpent, and he comes to Eve with a what? An apple. And what was the apple? A lie, right? It was a lie. What was the lie? He said, Eve, I don't know what God told you, but you eat that apple from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Connecting the dots here. If you eat that apple, you will be like God, right? And so she ate that apple, and then Adam ate that apple, and then they realized they were naked, and then they went and found, found somewhere to hide. And God comes and he says, who told you that? Who told you that? And so here we are in this cosmic battle for the rest of human history. 
And it brings us into the story of Genesis 3 where the Bible says this, I will put enmity between you. So this is God speaking to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So that's a theological way for him to say, Satan is going to bruise the heel of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, right? Good Friday. He's going to suffer and he's going to die on the cross. And it will appear as though death has won. You in your life right now, it may, as you look around your world, your culture, your individual life, it may look like death has won. And yet, three days later on that first Easter, Jesus stood up out of that grave and he defeated death, hell, and the grave. And so the story of the Bible follows this offspring through from Genesis all the way to Jesus. And the Bible says this, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. So in that battle, in the unseen realm, Jesus steps in. And so we could keep going. We could talk about the assassination attempt when he was born in a, in a manger, in a stable, when he was a baby, and how he overcame that or that he went to the cross and then triumphed over death. And scripture says, making a spectacle of the devil. So all of that being said, when you come to the church age in Acts chapter 2, the devil, the prince of this world, is not happy, right? He is a frustrated prince. And so you might wonder, why is there still good and evil happening in the world? Because for a time, it brings God glory to save people. And for a season, evil is allowed to run. The devil is allowed to run because you and I are not robots. But God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so this large storyline of the Bible brings us all the way to this point that we are, where I want to ask you, how will you see God and how will you fight the devil? Because if all of those things are working against you, if all those things are happening, both in the seen and the unseen, All of that brings us down to that all-important question. How will you fight the devil? I tend to lean where C.S. Lewis did. Big shocker. But he gave us a warning for our time 50 years ago. He said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. That would be error one. The other is to believe in their existence and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. All that to say, to not believe in them is to be a materialist, to say that there is no unseen realm. What we have is what we see. What we see is what we test. What we test is what we know. And then on the other side is to be so infatuated with demons that you can't get out of bed in the morning, that you can't move forward, that you see a demon behind every rock, when in fact you may have just forgot to order the groceries. Right? Not that I speak of experience. So where would Jesus have us be? How would Jesus inform us of how we ought to live our life, of how we ought to see him, of how we ought to fight the devil? I bring us all that way to get to John chapter 8, starting in verse 31. And Jesus is having a conversation. It's important for us to realize that he's having a conversation with religious people, with religious leaders, with Pharisees. And so that we know that he's speaking to people that believe that there is an unseen realm. And I want you to listen to what he talks about when it comes to the devil, the devil's strategy, and what our strategy is to live in freedom from that fight. And I want you to read it along with me. I'll read it out loud. You can read it on the screen. John chapter 8, verse 31 says this. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the what? The truth. And the truth will do what in your life? 
set you free. They answered him. Okay, that was offensive apparently. I read that and I'm like, thank God. (laughs) That was offensive to them. They answered him, we are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Now, time out. If you have read any Bible story in your entire life, you know that that is less than true. If they are the descendants of Abraham, have they ever been enslaved? A lot, like a whole lot, like a lot of their history. But that's not true. Have you ever met a supposed Christian who didn't tell you the truth? Don't answer that. Seems to be a theme. So look at what Jesus answers in verse 34. It says, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Isn't it interesting that that's his answer to that? Like they wanted to take it some other direction. He's like, no, 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 no. If you practice sin, you are in slavery to sin. So whatever you walked in here today carrying, Jesus is going to look you in the eye and say, no, no, no. Like all those things, like, If you are practicing sin, you are a slave to sin, and you are not going to see me from that place. But I love this. He doesn't stop there. He says in verse 35, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, then you will be free indeed. Super important. I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be what? Doing the works of Abraham did, embodying their faith, living out their faith. So they apparently are not doing that. But now, verse 40, you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are, you are in fact, doing the works of your father, right? So they believed they were Abraham's offspring. They were Abraham's offering, offspring, but they were not living out the faith of Abraham. And so they are doing the works of their father, but who is their father, you might ask? You're doing the works your father did. They said, and we were not born of sexual immorality. We only have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. So are you seeing what's being set up here? He's going to describe what it looks like to live out your faith, what it looks like to embody your faith, what it looks like to be redeemed by the blood of the lamb and adopted into, as Romans says, the kingdom of God and the family of God. That, that as James would say, You have to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer only. Not because you're working for God's favor, but because you're working from it. If you have a relationship with a good father, you're going to want to do the things that please that father. Some of you did not have a good relationship with your earthly father, and so it is difficult for you to understand or see how you could relate to a father that is good. And I totally understand that. But I want you to know that this father is good. And so he comes and he says this. You don't understand because, verse 44, you are of your father the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he's a liar and the father of all lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? 
Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Isn't it interesting that in this conversation, Jesus saw the primary fight against the devil as a fight between the truth and lies. I told you all of those things to get us to this point because I want you to recognize that the fight that's happening in our secular age is a fight between the truth and lies. And if you are of the Father, if the Son has set you free and you are free indeed, your moment moving forward, how will you fight the devil, comes in three things. And I want you to write these down. And then we're going to take communion together because you need Jesus more than you need my opinions and power. Amen? So write these down. Number one, you fight the devil with truth. Think about when Jesus came to this earth and he was living his life and he decided to step into the wilderness to commune with his father and the devil showed up. What did the devil offer to him? Lies. And what was Jesus' answer in every situation? Truth, right? He answers with truth. And so Jesus said right here in John 8, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We've been beating this drum for months, that there is no shortcut to you knowing the truth than to spend time in the truth. There's no shortcut to that. There are a million and one tools that can help you do that, but make no mistake about it, if you never spend time in the truth, in the word, then it's going to be difficult for you to feel like you've been set free in the moment that you live in. Because you'll be a slave to sin. You'll be a slave to the leading thought that's happening in culture. And that is no place to be as a child of God. Because what's available to you is freedom. Number two, you fight the devil with spiritual armor. So you fight the devil with truth, and then you are given these things in the word, in the truth, to fight the devil with. Ephesians 6.12 says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil that are in heavenly places. You cannot fight a spiritual battle with physical tools. Super important. What does that look like? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 17. You can write these down because I'm flying. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might, not your might, His might, right? He's already triumphed over death. So why would you try to triumph over death? You shouldn't. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Some of you are fighting battles. You walked into here fighting battles that are spiritual that you don't need to fight. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers, right? We just read that. So verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, right? Truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. We talked about that last week. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Right? Here we are again. Holiness and pursuing peace with all people. Commingled. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You fight the devil with spiritual armor. Every single one of those things is available to you right now. Like you can put them on right now. But you stand firm in the truth. Right? You have to fill your mind with truth. How do I, how do I even start that? If I'm struggling with this moment that we find ourselves, how, how do I even start that? 
right? Romans 12, 2. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? You fill it with what? Truth. So important. Fight the devil with truth. You fight the devil with spiritual armor. Number three, you fight the devil with prayer. You fight the devil with prayer. Just a little bit later in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, at the end of that spiritual armor passage, it says, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. So I brought you all this way to say, you need to read your Bible and you need to pray. You're like, Pastor, you could have made that a lot shorter. Same, bro. Like, I can get my get my money's worth, you know. <laughs> Kenny tells me that every week. Go longer. So it's his fault. <laughs> I say all of that to say you have to embody your faith. It doesn't just happen, right? Like, that's like my task in parenting. I just keep telling my kids, like, it's not just going to happen. Like, you got to do something, <laughs> right? When you go to work, a promotion doesn't just happen, right? Like, you got to do something. Like, we understand this intuitively. And in your faith, the devil would love nothing more than for you to just sit around and do nothing, right? But I want you to know that even in this moment, even in this secular moment that feels difficult, truth and freedom and armor are all available to you, like right now. And so how do we get it? How do we get it? We go back to Jesus, right? Because what did it say? It said, if you abide in my word, you'll be my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If the Son has set you free, not S-U-N, S-O-N, the Son of God, Jesus. It's all about Jesus. If the Son has set you free, you will be free indeed. So I would be remiss to lead us into the presence of the body and blood of Jesus, which is on a seat near you. You can grab one. We're going to do that in just a second. But I would be remiss if I told you all of that and didn't tell you how to become a child of God. I think it's important for us in this moment to think through what it is that we have given our life to. Because in 1 Corinthians 10, speaking of the body of Christ, here's what the Apostle Paul wrote to his friends in Corinth. He said, I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. There, this is the spiritual way, this is the, the natural way into the supernatural. Right? Like, just because there's wafer and juice here, like what does that have to do with anything? It has everything to do with everything. Because it's the natural way that Jesus chose for us to come into his presence. To participate with him. Can I just be honest with you? In, the, in these moments, like if there's a place where Jesus promises to participate with me, I want to be there. Like that's where I want to be. Because if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. So how do you become a child of God then? How do you, how do you get in there? The Bible says it's very simple and yet very difficult, right? That if you confess with your mouth, why? Because it's important for you to speak the truth. You confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, right? Because faith is the evidence of things not seen, Right? Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead because the resurrection is the central issue. If he didn't rise from the dead and triumph over sin, death, hell, and the grave, then we're wasting our time. We're completely wasting our time, but I have good news for you. He did. He rose from the dead and he triumphed over Satan. And there's coming a day, Revelation tells us, that he will finally do that in Revelation 20. And so all that to say, 
If you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. And the great thing is, is you don't need to come forward. You don't need to raise your hand. You don't need to pray the sinner's prayer. You need to do exactly that in your heart to the Lord. He's listening. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repentance simply means turn around and go a different way. And so as we walk through this, if you have never surrendered your life to the Lord, I would encourage you to do that right now and then take communion with us for the first time as a follower of Jesus. There's no better decision you could ever make in your life. Because we live in this age where good and evil are commingled. And if you don't have the truth, you will be in slavery for the rest of your life. So we jump to 1 Corinthians 11, and I would encourage you to take the top layer of that off and hold that wafer in your hand. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and so we take bread. And we hold it in our hand because we feel it. We feel the body of Jesus. And it says this, when he had given thanks, which we've been doing all morning through song and prayer and the word, it says that he broke it. And I would encourage you to, as you feel the body of Christ in your hands, that you would hold that up to your ear and that you would break it, that you'd be reminded that his body was broken for you, that there were physical consequences to the sin that so easily entangles us. And in that moment, he said, this is my body. Was it actually his body? No, he was sitting there. But it was the natural way into the spiritual participation of the Spirit of God in your life. And so this matters right now. This matters to you right now. That in this moment, he would participate with you if you just surrendered to him. And so he says, He broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we thinking of Jesus, take the bread together. Verse 25 says, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which we spent all morning talking about, so I won't again. But the fact that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave, we have a new covenant in his blood. And he says, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And here's another reason why it matters. Verse 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That participating in communion with God's people, communion of the saints, you're making a statement. You're making a statement about what is true in the world. Amen? So I'm have the band come back up. The Bible says that after Jesus did that, he took them outside onto a mountain It's too hot and we don't have any mountains. So it says they sung a hymn. And so we want to do that. We want to put our faith into practice. And so would you stand with me? And we're going to sing together.